Let's restart. Dear colleagues, the plenary meeting of the Consultative Forum is uh, an annual event that brings together civil society organizations, academics, members of the judiciary, EU institutions, EU agencies, and member states to look at the experience of the past year of working together within the agency. The third uh, as a Consultative Forum took place in Brussels on 11 and 12 December. We invite now Dr. Wieser, the agency's executive director, and also the chair of the ASO Consultative Forum to report back to the committee on this event. But if you don't mind, we could try to combine uh, this point with the presentation of the work program 2015 by Dr. Robert uh, Wieser, executive director uh, of the ag agency. Then maybe the, after two presentations of Dr. Wieser, we will have a time for questioning from the uh, um, MPs. Uh, Dr. Wieser, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Honorable members, it's a pleasure again since yesterday to be in your midst and to address you on the two issues that were just mentioned by the Chair, the work program and the consultative forum that we uh, had in the total of last year, but especially the plenary uh, that took place in December of last year. Allow me to be short, as you have all received the work program, uh, and allow me to take the opportunity to say a few of the general lines, or if you wish so, the philosophy behind what we are doing. It is maybe uncommon to look at the common European asylum system in the same way as I will now say, because we are always looking at where to improve. But if we look at it from a little distance, then the European asylum system is a common system and is a success. To quote a very unsuspected source in this, the American Director General of the International Organization for Migration recently said that Europe took by far the best stand as it goes on asylum in the world. Uh, that is not something to rest now and to be happy, uh, but it is certainly also with all the remarks that can be made, something to keep in mind. EASO is an agency, an operational agency, that is working in this area and specifically uh, in the implementation of the common European asylum system. As such, we are an instrument of the European solidarity. We are organizing that solidarity. There are three levels on which we are uh, concentrating. Let me first take the level of the caseworker, the asylum official in the member states, and how are we going to attribute to try to harmonize the operational level in the different member states. 30 member states, the associated countries also uh, are part of our remit, and even uh, two more might probably will uh, join soon. That is a huge area and a huge number of organizations. And to get them all on the same line to implement and to comply with the legislation that you as Parliament has decided on, uh, our approach is to start at the very beginning to start with the same training for all the asylum officials in the European Union. If you go to the same school, probably you learn to speak the same technical language, you learn to speak the same approach, and to create, in the end, a common culture. And if I tell you that we just passed the 6,300 asylum officials that we have trained so far, which is, in three years, quite a success if you 
keep in mind that the total number of asylum officials in the EU, we don't know the exact number because it's a moving target in a certain way, is supposed to be around the 7,000. So we reach out quite uh, effectively to that. After school, you have to work. So we provide, and we're starting just now, I finalized last week the first instrument, practical tools for the day-to-day -day work to support the caseworkers, the asylum officials in their day-to-day -day work to see that they really follow the procedures, that they really follow the law, the legislation uh, which, which they have to implement. Thirdly, we provide common country of origin information. Essential for each asylum decision is the information, the assessment of the situation in the countries of origin and already on a number of uh, important countries of origin we have made countries of origin reports and we're working on even more and to reach the top ten of the EU countries of origin. Finally on the level of case workers we work on joint approach on joint processing. We have the first pilots last year of joint processing. We will step up uh, this year, very soon, end of this month, we uh, start the next pilots. Uh, vulnerability assessment, asylum decisions, asylum applications. Very important to jointly, commonly build uh, the practice in Europe. We also focus on the level of member states. Member states as member states itself, member states as asylum institutions. Providing them with common information and common analysis of the trends. Providing them with a common support framework and common tools to implement the uh, asylum acquis. And to stimulate and facilitate the solidarity and responsibility of member states. As I said, IASO is an instrument of solidarity. Solidarity is not only about relocation, about distribution. Solidarity is about what is the whole instrument, the whole toolkit of common instruments. And in that sense, training, for example, is a remarkable point of solidarity. We use member states experts, member states trainers to train in other member states, to train other officials. Uh, in the operational level, we have a huge number of asylum experts from member states that are working in, at this moment, for example, Bulgaria, Italy, Cyprus and Greece. Finally, at the level of EU institutions, the EU level itself, the result and the way in which we try to support that is by common operations at EU level, both at the total level, so having regular annual schemes of support, and at individual member states level when needed. I just mentioned Bulgaria and other member states. We support and coordinate external dimension. Important to mention here that we will step up our activities on the resettlement. I know that is a subject that is very much in the heart of Parliament. I will switch now to the consultative forum, uh, because to do all this, we need not only the support of the member states, of the institutions, of the official network, but essential is that we have a good, productive dialogue with civil society. Civil society is a very diverse uh, situation. It's not one or two institutions. It is, what it is what is civil society. It is many sorts of NGOs, certainly in the area where we work. There are a, a huge number of organizations that from a very different angle uh, address the subject uh, of migration and asylum, from a general angle, from a gender angle, from a human rights angle, and you name it. Uh, at the same time, civil society is organized around academics, around 
uh, experts of all sorts around uh, also the judiciary that considers themselves partly as being civil society. That's fine for us. Uh, so we involve all those different groups in, uh, in our work and try to have an open dialogue on our work, taking advantage of the expertise and having uh, that joint uh, discussion about what we can do. As civil society is so diverse, we have an open system of consultative forum. Every organization can apply directly to the IASO consultative forum. There is no barrier in that. Last December, we had our annual, fourth annual conference with civil society. About 100 participants uh, took uh, an active role in the forum uh, that we had around a large number of subjects, 20 different uh, contributions from very different stakeholders uh, were at uh, the agenda. Apart from that, let me tell you something more about the consultative forum. At this moment, we have about 70 organizations uh, that we consult on a regular basis. On all sorts of subjects, we are open to contributions of every sort, but we have also focused consultation channels, one on training, one on unaccompanied minors, and one on early warning. And we are looking into the possibility of involving more in COI, country of origin information. In that context of country of origin information, I'm very happy to announce that this year we hopefully uh, can open public access to the COI portal. That is a wish. We have been working on it for quite some time and provided, and under the condition of the ICT possibilities, uh, we hope this year to open up. We will also engage civil society even more in our work on children and unaccompanied minors and go and have focused meetings with national and local NGOs. This is as far as I would inform you about the consultative forum. Last, but in no way least, I can only stress that an agency working in an area like this needs the resources to do the work. And in this respect, I am most grateful to Parliament and especially to this committee for the support that in the budget discussions of last year uh, on the 2015 budget you have uh, shown us uh, and we will certainly, hopefully, not disappoint you, but work and I'm entirely at your disposal. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, now we have time for discussion and statements of MPs. Uh, yes, Mr. Keller. Keller. Thank you. That's probably me. Um, no worries. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mr. Risse, for your introduction. I have a couple of questions. Uh, with regard to the training that you're doing for asylum officials, would you or could you say that you have recognized any member states where the original training of asylum officials would have been uh, deficient or maybe other member states that have an outstanding training for asylum officials? Then with regards to the country of origin reports that you do, could you give us an update about what's the sources that you're using for those reports and how regularly you're updating them and you know, with which criteria you're doing them? And also whether those reports are actually respected and used in the member states when asylum decisions are being taken. And then maybe more specifically, um, how would you currently uh, in such a report, evaluate the situation for Roma in the Western Balkan states. And um, also, since there has been a lot of controversy around that, uh, the, the terminology of a, third, uh, of a safe third country, 
Um, what would you say after your experience in working on, in the EASA, what is a safe third country? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Metzola. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Visser, for your presentation. And uh, let me congratulate you on uh, having uh, organized this other consultative forum. Um, I believe that these uh, four are crucial in ensuring that member states, civil society, academics and EU institutions all come together to examine the work of the agency and we should build on this experience and grow. My question is on the choice of venue. Uh, can I ask you why you did decide to organize this meeting in Brussels rather than in EASO's host country, which is Malta? It is a trend that we are seeing an increasing number of EASO's meetings taking place outside its host state, and I wanted to flag this issue and get your views on it. On the work program, um, my question is to do with relocation. Uh, as I have flagged in this committee before, EASO has a legal obligation to promote relocation activities as per the regulation establishing it. Today, as Malta rescues another 85 persons from the sea, I would like to underline that relocation of beneficiaries of international protection is a tangible form of concrete solidarity with countries on the periphery, and this is an issue that has been repeatedly pushed by this Parliament. In your opinion, Mr. Visser, do you think that EASO has done enough to promote this concept with member states? And what can we do more? Can you give us an overview of what uh, the member states that EASO has spoken to in this regard has been? And uh, in this, also on this point, what has uh, their reaction been? Thank you very much. And Ms. Wikström. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish you very welcome, uh, Dr. Visser, for sharing this exper these experiences with us in this committee. Um, it was a, a good presentation, an impressive one, and I wish to recognize and congratulate you on the 6,500 asylum officials that you have trained in only three years' time. Very well done. Uh, are there at all any deficiencies when it comes to member states providing officials? Would they come from all member states, or do you see a reluctance in certain member states to actually participate in those training exercises? And all in all, we, my group, and, and this committee is committed to follow the EASO work and the work in progress, but we also have a tendency sometimes to look at EASO as almost messiah. Whenever something goes wrong, whenever there is something missing in the link when, for asylum seekers or refugees, we are pointing with the whole hand and saying that it's, it's up to us to, to do this, do that. And we must also consider that it takes resources to fulfill the task that you have taken to, up to, until today. But it would be interesting to see, is there any gap, something that you would feel that you would still wish to, to do? Is there anything that we should maybe underline the importance of, of entrusting you? And another point also, uh, as I started out, I'm happy that you're here today, but in the next point of the agenda we will have Frontex and the Consultative Forum of Frontex, and they will be represented by, uh, by members on the consultative forum. It's very nice that you're here, but next time, could you at least consider sending, sending someone being in, in this consultative forum? Because it is really important that NGOs keep up their good work and, and feel that they are needed in this forum. Frontex can actually serve as a good example on that. So I, maybe you should stay and listen to them, what experiences they have also to be represented by an organization that is a member of their consultative forum. So by that, I'm again happy that you're here and wish you all the best in days to come. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ms. Sipa, as a coordinator, do you want to have a plural? Um, I would like to concentrate on one question because on all the debates we have on uh, asylum and some challenges, we very, very often do concentrate, of course, on the situation in the Mediterranean. But uh, from some colleagues, of course, we hear we have 
other borders, of course, also where refugees, asylum seekers are coming to. We already had a short report from the Fundamental Rights Agency that uh, sometimes not all the measures are implemented and used correctly when it comes to that situation. But I would like to hear if uh, you could give some more information on changes on outside borders like Romania, Bulgaria. Are the numbers of asylum seekers increasing? Is the situation changing? What are the differences when you describe the situation there compared with the situation in our South European countries? That would be very helpful. And Ms. Ferreira, uh, as coordinator, do you want to have a floor? Or is she? No? Oh, thank you very much. No. Okay. Ms. Spinelli, please. Grazie, signor Visser. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Visser. I have two questions. One is on a series of criticisms levelled on the point raised by Mrs. Vickstrom. So I, too, would very much like to hear what your reaction is to those criticisms. And then the second question has to do with the agreement that was signed between ESO and Frontex in 2012. And what I wanted to ask you, Mr. Visser, whether it might be possible to think about an EASO official being present in all of the search and rescue operations of Frontex so as to ensure that asylum seekers' rights are defended, because it would seem that there are times that their rights aren't always fully protected in these Frontex operations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Radev, please. Благодаря госпожа председател, уважаеми господин Висер, в плана на европейска Thank you very much, Chair. In this program for 2015, there are activities to implement the plan and to support Bulgaria. And this was signed between IASA and the Bulgarian uh, government in 2014. Uh, we have had to take 350 refugees coming from uh, other member states. Now, bearing in mind uh, the expected flows of immigrants, what will be helping with the uh, happening with the help and expertise from your authorities? Can you tell us uh, in what phase the preparation is, and uh, to what extent you will be able to help us with the challenges that we are facing? Thank you. Okay, and uh, the last person, Miss uh, Major. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Fisser, thank you for your brief presentation. I have a number of questions. You use the word solidarity several times. And one thing that struck me in the last statistics I've seen for the Netherlands is that six countries take almost 70 percent of the asylum seekers. So how do you think solidarity works in practice? And then, secondly, I see in your work program that you also support third countries. Well, um, if we're talking about solidarity, should we not uh, do more to allow people to stay in their regions and provide support there? The rich Gulf states, uh, for example, who have lots of money, uh, Qatar, for example, has only taken uh, 36 refugees. So I think that the principle of solidarity should apply to them as well. Could you react to that, please?
Okay. And uh, Ms. Winberg. Thank you for that, and thank you for coming here, Dr. Wisse. Thank you very much for being with us here today. I have been considering what you said. I'm Swedish. We're probably the country in Europe that uh, has the most uh, immigrants. We have such an amount, it's very hard to uh, deal with them. We have to rethink, I think, uh, the asylum policy in the EU. I don't think it's uh, right that the EU should decide uh, on numbers of migrants for different uh, countries. We have talked about solidarity before, but I uh, wonder uh, what we can expect here from member states. They should assume their own responsibilities. When it comes to these uh, refugees, we should perhaps try and help people in refugee camps. That's real solidarity. Perhaps you could talk to other member states and see about them uh, accepting a larger percentage of refugees. Okay. Uh, now we have time for answers. Uh, Dr. Vizor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much to all the members who, for their questions. Uh, I will just go on my list and try to answer each of them. Uh, Mrs. Keller asked about the training and if there are outstanding and less outstanding member states in this respect. Uh, let me explain one thing in general on the position of an EU agency and certainly of this EU agency. Uh, we have an area of concern that is in the founding regulation. We have no instruments to force or oblige member states to follow or to uh, accept what we uh, offer. So we have to uh, convince by quality uh, the products uh, that we have. I think that is a good system. I don't ask uh, for any formal competences uh, to appoint and to point at member states at all. Uh, and given the fact that it is a voluntary system, uh, I think that the results that I described in training, uh, more than 6,000 people in three years, is a quite significant signal uh, and a positive signal. Uh, having said that, you see, we see differences between member states. There are member states that follow in their training program 100% the EASO training uh, modules, the EASO training curriculum. There are member states that have a very long uh, and, and, and established uh, training system, and they use it complementary. Uh, but if I look just in the increase over the three years, I see overall a very big increase in uh, the attention and in the willingness of member states to use it. There's also a very practical reason for that. We have the new asylum package, so all the member states, all the training institutes have to adapt their training. And we do it together, we do it in a common way, so we happen to be at the right moment, at the right place. Uh, I don't claim all the credits, it's also a bit of luck, uh, but positive luck and the member states and uh, we are good in this together. Uh, on CUI, the full answer on, on your question will be uh, a very long lecture about methodology, uh, about how we use sources. Uh, the specific thing that we have and quite uh, different from what member states in general do, is that we have started with CUI to make a very solid uh, methodology of how you use CUI. It's important, as we all know, that in CUI the sources are reliable, that the sources are double-checked, that you 
are transparent on what sources you use and what you don't use, what you believe or not, do not believe. Uh, that methodology has been uh, already in the first year of IASO uh, developed by using the different experiences of member states, by using the EU and Commission uh, experience on this, and that is the methodology, and we are still uh, developing in this. This year we will have a review uh, taking into account the experience so far. Uh, but it is a public and a transparent methodology. That's extremely important. You can find it on the website. About updating, that is, that's a very essential part of CUI. Uh, the tradition in Europe is that you make a CUI report and then after one or two years uh, you review it or you don't. Uh, what we try to do is not to enter in this uh, trap, I would say. So only to go into areas where we know on forehand that we can refresh and review uh, the COI. We have even, but I cannot promise that it will already be possible this year, we have even the intention of making uh, permanent updated systems. With ICT you can update, uh, I won't say by the day, but very, recent, very uh, regular, and that our COI reports, which are all public and all online uh, to be seen, are feed in with the most updated information on a constant process. Uh, that is a challenging uh, thing because I just look at Mrs. Wickstrom who asked, do you have anything? Well, that is a resource intense and resource is not so much money in this case. It is just a lot of work. You need hands and, and brains in this case uh, to do that. Uh, but it is certainly uh, essential. Is it used? That is, of course, the real question. Uh, we are not only offering something, but is it used? Uh, yes, it is absolutely used, uh, different in different member states. We are trying to f figure out why that is. In some member states, it is very uh, quickly to the highest courts, the highest national courts, and really used uh, on, on, on a very solid base. And in other member states, it is not that much uh, distributed. It is certainly improving and uh, extending much more. Uh, in this area, of course, it takes some time bef before uh, the routine is taking on board something new. Uh, the fact that we have, in the second half of last year, published a number of reports, I think that it takes a few months before they are reflected in decisions and before the judges will react on it. But there's an absolutely positive uh, reaction in general. Uh, the Western Balkan and the Romas. First, I could refer to the report on the Western Balkans that we have issued uh, a year and a half ago. The situation is not much different from that. We nevertheless are uh, looking into a review for this year uh, because of the high, consistent high number of uh, people coming from uh, the Western Balkan, and as we know, most of them are of Roma origin. Uh, the conclusion at that time was that it is not primarily an asylum-related issue, but it is an integration uh, issue in the Western Balkan itself. Uh, that is as far as that's concerned, that is outside of the competence of the agency, uh, but it's the, the, the result of, of the situation, of course, is of, of concern to us. Uh, related to that, the third, safe third countries, we will try to contribute to that debate. Uh, at this moment, I do not have uh, data to, to provide to you uh, on, on the question how to deal with it. Uh, and in the end, probably it will be a very political decision. 
but safe third countries will never be 100% everybody who comes from a country, with the exception of the EU member states uh, among themselves. There always will be the individual that, even from a very safe country, is able to uh, prove that he or indicate that he or she uh, has serious fear uh, for prosecution, etc. Uh, but I think it is a good moment in time to discuss at least the concept of safe third countries because it, it pops up every time and then uh, it confuses either we do it or we don't. That is in the end a decision that you have to take and to discuss with the Council. Uh, but there are certainly facts and figures that we can provide for this discussion. Uh, Madam Metzola, why suddenly we pop up in Brussels? Well, of course, because here's the European Parliament, uh, so I wouldn't dare not to be in Brussels. And as the European Parliament is asking me more often, I am more often in, uh, in Brussels. But that is maybe not what you were referring to. Uh, why the Consultative Forum this year in, uh, in Brussels? The answer is very simple. Uh, that is a very, very, very explicit remark and request from civil society. Uh, not the full consultative forum is NGOs and local uh, organizations, but a large part and an important part of the consultative forum is organizations uh, that are dependent on relatively low budgets uh, and have asked because they're more organized around Brussels than around Malta. I can't help it. Uh, and, that, and that's the reason. We have decided for one time uh, to answer positively this, this explicit request. Uh, what we will do for the next consultative forum, I cannot yet say, because we have to see the experiences uh, of, of this forum, if it really answers uh, the, uh, the request, uh, f f to a certain extent even criticism, from the Consultative Forum on the location. Shortly said, uh, a number of, an important number of organizations reacted, you make it impossible for us to participate. That is hard criticism. Uh, so that, that, that's the reason why we tried it this year in, in, in Brussels. On relocation, do I enough? Well, the first question maybe should be, do the member states enough? As you know, the political situation is that the Council is in broad consensus, not total consensus, but broad consensus, not to, to table the subject of relocation. Nevertheless, the Commission, and we fully are engaged in uh, this process, uh, the Commission has decided to have a forum on relocation, one last year and a second one in November last year, and in four weeks from now there will be a third one. Uh, so we are act actively supporting the Commission and doing what is in our own possibility. We have several uh, actions in preparing how to do if there is a possibility of relocation, but the decision of relocation, as is also in our regulation and, and as is the general policy, is voluntary. Uh, that is something you can reproach other people, but certainly the, not an agency that is only in, uh, in that sense a depending sign. Uh, but we will continue to stimulate where possible uh, this discussion and, and, and to, to bring it to a next level, if it's possible. Um, Madam Bickstrom, uh, on the training, uh, I already said uh, something about it. Uh, is there enough participation of member states? We have a trainer's pool of about, uh, I say it by heart, 174 
trainers. They are not all permanently involved. There is a core group of between the 60 and 70 that are uh, active on a regular basis. Up till this moment, we can manage, but we certainly want to go on, uh, both in numbers, because the involvement of more people from different member states is a very important part, and on the quality level, to ensure that we are now in the process of uh, looking to certify our trainings. Certification is a quality process, it's very important, but it's also important for the participants, because if you participate in a, a serious training and you get a formally certified diploma afterwards, it's nice not only to put it in your office on the wall, uh, but also for your CV and for your boss, because he has comparison, he can say, okay, this is a guaranteed level and this is what I can accept. So hopefully this will help uh, for the next step. I'm not qualified to answer the question if we are the Messiah, uh, but certainly uh, I notice as well that <laughs> there is a large demand and sometimes uh, expectations that we can change the world. Well, at least we have the ambition. Uh, and at the same time, the common sense to know that there's still a lot to be done. Uh, I can only repeat what I said earlier on. Uh, in this stage of development, for IASO is important the staff, the number of human resources that we have. Uh, to take one other example, beside what I said about COI, uh, there is an increasing demand and an understandable demand on uh, data, on information, on analysis. Uh, we have seen in the last few years that that really increases our possibility, our understanding of what happens. And you need understanding before you can go to a solution. That is, that is human resource intense work. That is not something you can outsource. That is not something you can do by computers only. You need computers, but that is secondary. Uh, but you need the right brains to do it. Uh, so I only can say once again, thank you to Parliament for giving us extra resources because I fully understand and I'm aware that in these years it is a very uh, special position that we have uh, and we will fully uh, use the extra steps and the extra resources that you have provided us. Uh, the consultative forum and the consultative forum of Frontex. I know the consultative forum of Frontex very well because we are a member of the consultative forum of Frontex. Uh, as Frontex is participating, we don't use the word member, so that is a little different concept, but as Frontex is participating in our consultative forum. Uh, I am here also as member of the ASO consultative forum, because I am member. Uh, I'm even chair, chairman of the consultative forum. It's a different uh, concept, the Frontex one and the ASO one. Uh, it both has its advantages. I very much, given the sort of uh, area in which we work, uh, think that for IASO as an agency, our broad approach of uh, NGOs and using expertise directly in our work, not in a different, separate uh, organization, but directly. They participate in our expert meetings. They contribute uh, directly to, to new training modules, for example, uh, for vulnerable group uh, documents, tools that, that we are developing. Uh, I think for us this is a, a good formula. Uh, Frontex has a different concept but also a different remit in their work uh, and for them it might be very well that the best 
form is, is uh, the, cho the choice that they have made. Madam Sipel, on the change from south to east, I summarize it like that if you allow me. Uh, absolutely. We see a serious change uh, from south to east. Uh, if you just realize, to take one example only, that in Hungary last year you saw a rise in influx of 975%. Now, the starting one was low, but at the end of last year, uh, Hungary had 15,000 uh, uh, asylum seekers, uh, which is, for their standards, extremely high. Uh, and that is not only there. In Bulgaria, we see a substantial rise. So the east border uh, is not – well, we, we, we are tempted by pictures also to concentrate on the south border. That is imp important, no doubt, but you're absolutely right. Let's not forget that there are more borders. Beside borders, there's more. And that is something um, I take the opportunity, if you allow me, to, to bring to your attention. Uh, if you look at the total number that we can detect, I don't say we can see everything, that we can detect, mainly Frontex, but also in our asylum statistics, that come to Europe, that is about 270, 300,000. The total number of asylum applicants last year was more than 630,000. Not all the asylum applicants that knock on our door are directly coming and crossing borders. It's, it's good to realize it's very difficult at this moment. We try to, to substantiate it with, with data, but it's extremely difficult to have the data. Uh, but a large number of asylum applicants have come to Europe by legal ways, being students, being, uh, having work, whatever. You can imagine that that happens. If you take this situation from Syria, you are a Syrian, you go to university in Europe, and suddenly in your home country something happens, and you say, okay, I cannot return. So it is not, what, it is not abusing systems in general. It might be sometimes. Uh, but this is the situation. It's not, every, not, not everybody is just passing a border and asking for asylum. So two trends. One, it's not only the south, it's also the east. And two, it's not only by borders, but it's also by other, other means. Uh, Madam Spinelli, uh, the consultative forum, I already made some remarks. Uh, the working arrangement, uh, Frontex and EASO, we work very closely uh, on a number of uh, issues. Uh, training, we have a joint training program for border guards. So in that sense, already EASO is active in the atmosphere, in, 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 the, in the context of uh, Frontex operations. Uh, I know the idea of having IASO officials as a sort of uh, guardians uh, on uh, Frontex operations. In the end, I think it should be the organization itself. It should need not be one person that is the guardian and the rest are the, 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 the bad guys. Uh, we all should be the good guys, uh, playing the role that we, ha that we have. That is why I think that in the end, the training of all border guards is much more effective than having border guards and one to guard the human rights. Uh, but I take your point and I see uh, what you mean. Allow me to, to give it some extra thinking. Uh, Mr. Radev, um, what are we doing in Bulgaria? We have supported Bulgaria since the end of 2013, when suddenly the numbers in Bulgaria rose very quickly. That 
program ended uh, last year, and at the 5th of December last year, I signed a second phase program with Bulgaria to support Bulgaria to further invest and build up their capacity. Bulgaria has done a wonderful work uh, during the last one and a half years, uh, stepping up impressively on capacity, on their quality. But of course, in one and a half years, you cannot uh, do everything and certainly to have a sustainable uh, process, uh, more support is, is, is needed, and the Bulgarian government has asked me to do so. Uh, we will support them in training, in further building up their COI capacity, uh, their statistical capacity, and the way in which to manage and to organize the reception centers. Madam Atera, on the solidarity uh, Meyer, sorry, Meyer. Did I say Matera? I said Meyer. Sorry, excuse me. Apologies. Uh, on the solidarity. Uh, that is probably the, the longest and most exciting discussion that we could have. Um, Comparing is a very difficult and dangerous thing because you should compare comparable situations um, and without going into denying, I would like to nuance a little bit uh, the different images that are in this discussion. If you say six countries receive 70% of the asylum seekers, then you're right. But if you imply with that that the other 22 member states do not comply with their obligations and that they are the bad guys, to use the word again, then I think you are not comparing the right things because those six countries are not, do not only have 70% of the asylum seekers, they also have 70% of the European population, they have 70% of the size of the European population and have even more than 70% of the GDP of Europe. It is not, I think, I don't say that it is your intention, but it, it's not a fair comparison to say that Germany should take as many asylum seekers as Estonia, or even worse, Estonia should take as many asylum seekers as Germany. Everybody understands that that is not, not the case. So that's why comparing uh, is, is a delicate thing. Uh, I realize that it is far too short time uh, to go into this more, but it's, it's just a general remark that that I ask you to, uh, to consider. Having said that, uh, more solidarity absolutely is number one on the agenda. I said uh, already solidarity is the expression of solidarity. IASO is the instrument of solidarity uh, in Europe. We are instrumental in solidarity. I don't say that we have reached the full and most perfect solidarity yet. That is something else. But we have a lot of actions that are dedicated and uh, aimed at creating solidarity. If Bulgaria suddenly is under, under a huge pressure and has a system that cannot cope on the short track of that situation, and we organize broad support from other member states, and that's why IASO uh, is, is, is set up, is, is established. Uh, to support Bulgaria, that is what I call solidarity. Uh, if we want all the member states to comply with the European acquis, with the European legislation, 
on asylum. And the Iran member states that cannot organize it because of, for example, their size, uh, certain aspects of that. And we have an organization, an agency, that is capable of supporting, of assisting those member states to comply. I think that is solidarity. So solidarity is a, is, is a multifaceted subject. It's not only one subject. Uh, second, um, more reception, more protection in the region. I couldn't agree more. I very much uh, uh, hope that it is possible to do more. For a relatively small agency like IASO, uh, it's, it, we can support actions in this field. Uh, if you really want us autonomously or at least to an important extent to set up protection systems outside of Europe, then you speak about a totally different uh, aim. Once again, I think that it is absolutely something that uh, should be on the agenda, that is on the agenda it's in the regional protection programs of the Commission. It is a very important uh, subject, uh, but it is not for an agency of the size that, that we have something that alone we can do. Uh, finally, Madam Winberg, uh, actually my last remark is also a remark in, in, in your direction. Uh, refugee camps, supporting refugee camps outside of Europe is real solidarity. Uh, and in the end, I think that the long-term, durable, sustainable way of uh, dealing with migration and asylum is to support in a regional setting uh, those who are looking around and say something happens. At this moment, I don't feel safe. I have to go somewhere. Uh, but most people, let's be honest, most people in the world, everywhere, if you ask them, do you want to spend the rest of the, your life far away, or do you want to stay close where your family was born, your children, etc.? Most people, except the adventurers, say, well, I prefer to stay close, but sometimes I'm forced to go far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wieser. Uh, we understand the importance of uh, the activities of your institutions and, uh, and I think uh, it's good that uh, the fi additional financial support done by the Parliament was uh, very useful for you. Thank you for a very fruitful and uh, interesting discussion and answer. Thank you. And now we we can welcome Ms. Balestero as well as uh, Stefan Kessler uh, for the discussion about Frontex consult Consultative Forum Fundamental Rights. Uh, could you please come to us? Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs>